hear these words from Psalm 121. It says, I lift my eyes up to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. And then also hear these words from Matthew chapter 11, sometimes called the great invitation from our great king. It says this, And at the time Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And here's the beautiful part. Come to me. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. How beautiful that we get to come to our God when we're heavy and weary, and then he offers us rest. Grace and peace to you from God who is and who was and who is to come and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and ruler of the kings of the earth. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here, for for taking time out of your day so that we can celebrate Herm's life. But even more than that, rejoice in God's faithfulness through Herm's life. And celebrate the God whom, whom, whom Herm trusted in with his life. We gather in God's presence to remember and to give thanks for the life of Herm, to affirm God's love for us, and to support one another in a time of need. So let us acknowledge our grief and be open in our love, affirming the meaning and the mystery of life. Confident confident in the hope of the resurrection that is through Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus said in John 15, greater love has none than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Isn't it a beautiful thing that God not only calls us his subjects, who we are in allegiance to, but he calls us his friends. He wanted the disciples to see that the cross, see the the cross and think that God substituted himself for me under God's wrath. God substituted Jesus for us. We don't have to suffer the wrath of God if we trust in Christ. And he did it because he views us as his treasured friends. He wants us to view the cross as an affection-filled sacrifice for friends. And we get to gather and worship this God. This God who calls us friends. This God who laid down his life for his friends. So let us stand together and let us sing what a friend we have in Jesus. And the lyrics you'll find on the back of the pamphlet this morning, this afternoon. Let's stand and sing.
Good afternoon, family and friends. It's good to be with you here today. Uh, my relationship with Herm Hoovey began a long time ago in the summer of 1983 when I became the pastor of this church. And believe me, I've got lots of memories of Herm. And I'm sure that many of you do as well. Herm was a guy who took his relationships with his pastors seriously. And he did not hesitate to share what was on his mind. And there were many times when Herm shared with me what was on his mind. Uh, he was a guy who took his relationship with his church seriously. And as I have been thinking the last several days since hearing about Herm's death and anticipating speaking at the service this afternoon, uh, there's one picture or one word that kept coming to my mind, and that word is faithfulness, faithful. Herm was a faithful member of Riesland Reformed Church. You could count on him being here. You could count on him being in his seat right back there. Every Sunday morning and every Sunday night, Herm was here, as well as attending other events throughout the week. And he had an incredible memory. <laughs> uh, he remembered dates. He remembered happenings. He remembered things that happened in consistory. He had served on consistory. I remember one night he was at our house at the parsonage, and we were talking about something, and he said to me, do you remember what happened? And I'll just throw out the number five. I don't remember how many years it was. But do you remember what happened five years ago tonight? And I said, no, I don't remember. And he said, that was the night that so-and-so came to the consistory and did such-and-such. -such. And I won't tell you who the so-and-so was or what the such-and-such -such was, but he remembered that. He remembered dates. As Bill Zweigheisen said before this service started a little while ago, we've lost our historian. He always remembered my age. He knew when my birthday was. And so he had an incredible memory. And... Uh, he made regular visits to our house when we lived in the parsonage. And then after we left here and after I was no longer the pastor here and we lived on 8th Avenue out toward Jamestown, Herm would still come and pay us visits. You see, he used to get this weekly newspaper called Grit. Any of you heard of Grit? Yeah. Well, Grit was a weekly newspaper, 14 pages long. It was geared toward rural America. And Grit is no longer a, a newspaper. It lasted for over 100 years, but it still continues because today it is a bi-monthly magazine, and you can subscribe to it. But, but back in those days, Herm received the Grit newspaper, and at one point, Marilyn said to him that she really enjoyed reading those grit newspapers that he gave her. And so he continued to come. And every month or two, Herm would show up with some more grit newspapers. And not only that, he also would come to share with me the latest news of what was happening at uh, Vriesland Church. And uh, so I've got lots of memories. And when I was asked to uh, bring the message uh, for this service today, I went back into my records, and I discovered that I did Herm's father's funeral 34 years ago, uh, on January 6, 1988. And I used Psalm 42 for my message for John Hoovey's funeral service. And as I read through that psalm, I thought that it would be fitting to use it for my message today. Now, the reason I, I feel that way is because this psalm expresses uh, a longing for God. 
And I'm going to read it in a couple of minutes, and you're going to hear that. Uh, the psalm writer is, is longing for God. And the authorship of Psalm 42 is uncertain. You see, we often think of David as the writer of the psalms. David wrote many of the psalms, but he didn't write all of them. And so in your Bibles, you will notice when you turn to some of the psalms, it'll say a psalm of David or a psalm of somebody else. But uh, in Psalm 42, it doesn't say that. In the superscription, those words following the title, Psalm 42, before verse 1, it says, For the director of music, a mescal of the sons of Korah. And the reference to the director of music and uh, a mescal, which means a communication or a lesson, uh, those references are not new, but the reference to the sons of Korah is new. And there are 11 psalms that are associated with the sons of Korah. And so there are some biblical scholars and teachers who believe that the sons of Korah wrote Psalm 42, but there are other scholars who don't believe that uh, they were the author of this psalm. They think that that's a reference to uh, members of the Levitical tribe who were leading the music in the uh, services that happened uh, when the people gathered for worship. And there are biblical scholars who believe very firmly that David, even though he's not mentioned here, was the author of Psalm 42. And one of those scholars is Charles Spurgeon. This is what he says. Although David is not mentioned as the author, this psalm must be the offering of his pen. It is so Davidic. It smells of the son of Jesse. It bears the marks of his style and experience in every letter. We could sooner doubt the authorship of the second part of Pilgrim's Progress than question David's title to be the composer of this psalm. Well, whether or not David was the author of Psalm 42, uh, there is a longing here for God. The writer of these words longs for God. And I think that this is a fitting psalm for Hearn's funeral service this afternoon because he too had a longing for God. And I think that that's the reason why he was so faithful in attending services here at Vriesland Church. He came regularly and he read his Bible at home regularly because he longed for God. He longed to be in God's presence. He longed to hear from God. He longed to speak to God. And so he had a longing for God. Well, follow along, or if you want to take a Bible and, and follow along as I read, you can. Either follow along or listen as I read Psalm 42. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God. And I can imagine that Herm felt like that at times during the last couple of years or the last months when he could no longer come here and gather with God's people for worship. I can imagine he said these things I remember as I pour out my soul how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the Mighty One with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony. As my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, Where is your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? 
Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Now, I want you to notice uh, several things that uh, the author here is telling us about uh, this longing for God. Uh, one thing is that this longing has a basis. Um, many of us, I'm confident in saying, have most likely experienced what uh, David is expressing in verse 1. We, we felt the same way. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. Haven't we all had times when we've dealt with different things in life that were not easy or found ourselves in different experiences? Haven't we all had times when we have, have longed for God? We've wanted to know that God was with us, that God hears us, that God is helping us. I want to tell you, years ago, when I was the pastor here and my son Travis was in a terrible car accident and uh, our family went through some horrible weeks and the church released me for a number of weeks from my responsibilities here as Travis was in the hospital in Grand Rapids for weeks and even months. But I want to tell you, during that time, I felt this longing for God. I longed for God's presence. I longed for God's help. And this, this basis is a part of the human heart. It's just a part of our makeup. As St. Augustine put it, Thou hast made us for thyself, O God, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. People were made for God. People have an inherent longing for God. But sad to say, not everybody realizes that and not everybody will admit that. And it's, uh, it's so sad that in our world today, there are so many people that are seeking to find satisfaction in life, satisfaction in their souls apart from God. And they, they're just not aware of the fact that uh, the longing that is within them can only be filled by God. Jesus told a couple of parables that brought this out. Uh, he told the parable of uh, the rich farmer. And uh, this rich farmer, his crops were doing great. He couldn't uh, contain everything in his barns. And so he said, uh, I'll, uh, I'll tear my barns down and I'll build bigger barns so that I can store my grain. And then I'll say to myself, Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this night your life will be taken from you, and then who will have all of these things that you've prepared for yourself? And so it was not in these things that uh, he was going to find true satisfaction. And Jesus told the parable of the prodigal son who wanted his share of his father's estate. He got it. He left home. He went to the far country. He lived a wild and profligate life. He finally got to the bottom of the barrel. He was slopping hogs and had nothing else left. And he said, I will go back to my father. And so he came to that realization that his deepest needs in life could not be found in these things that he was striving for, but it could only be found in God. Well, not only do we have this, this longing for God, God has this longing for us. God desires to be in relationship with us. That's why he sent Jesus, who made it possible for us to be in a relationship with him. God and human beings are intended to have fellowship together. And so it's just a part of our makeup that we have this longing. And uh, the psalmist remembers how God's presence was experienced in worship in verse 4 when he said, These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the Mighty One. Well, there's another thing that the writer of this psalm tells us about this longing, and that is that it has an immediate reason. And the immediate reason for this longing uh, is expressed in that uh, first verse where he says, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you. 
Well, when you think about the deer, the immediate reason that that deer was panting for water might have been that it was living in an area where there was a drought, or he could have been pursued by hunters. But just picture a deer, and he's fleeing, and his tongue is hanging out, and he's just panting for water. And so that is the immediate reason there. And uh, the immediate reason why David, if he is the author of this psalm, and I think he is, the immediate reason that he wrote these words, it's often thought, was when he was banished from Jerusalem because his son Absalom was pursuing him. And so like a deer panting for water, David is panting for God. But whatever the need, David felt oppressed and that he urgently needed God. And I imagine that Herm had times when he felt like that in the last months and years of his life. His life changed. He couldn't do the things that he used to do. He couldn't come here like he used to. And so I imagine that he felt like that. And uh, I also need to point out that uh, for a Christian, this longing for God is never completely fulfilled in this life. The complete fulfillment of that longing takes place when we reach heaven. And something else that... Uh, the author brings out about this longing is that it's very intense. And the intensity of this longing is suggested by the words panting and thirsting. Uh, his desire for God is like a thirst or a strong appetite. Uh, if you've been hungry, really hungry, you know that that hunger can consume your whole body. And so David is feeling like that. He's got a strong thirst, a, a hungry appetite for God. I'm reminded of an experience I had when I was the pastor here. Uh, some of you will probably remember this, but I was a part of a group who went to the Grand Canyon with a group of high school boys. And uh, we had a number of leaders, and they were divided into teams. And I had a group of boys that I led into the Grand Canyon, and we lived there for three days. We carried everything on our backs. And when you get down into the Grand Canyon, it's like a desert. And I want to tell you, water became very precious when I was on that trip. Fortunately, the team that I was leading went down to the bottom of the canyon, way down by the Colorado River, uh, to a place where there was a fresh flowing stream of water. And I don't remember what it was called, Rainbow Rapids or something like that. We bathed in that stream and we had fresh water to drink, but water became precious to me. Well, the writer of Psalm 42 feels the need for God just as intensely as our bodies feel the need for water when we are experiencing thirst. And then one more thing that we learn here in this psalm is that this longing can be fulfilled. The psalmist knows where his thirst can be quenched. In the last part of verse 8, he says, a prayer to the God of my life. His longing, his thirsting can be fulfilled only in God himself. God is the God who gives us life. And we need to be longing for God much more than just longing for God's blessings or for the things he gives us. Well, today is a day of joy and thanks because uh, we're thankful today for Herm's long life and for his service. We're thankful that his suffering has ended. We're thankful that his longing has ended, that his thirst has been quenched, and that his faithfulness has been rewarded. He is now in heaven. And there's no longing and no thirst there. In Revelation 22, John is describing a vision that the angel gave him of heaven. 
And in Revelation 22, verse 1, he says that he sees this clear, flowing stream coming from the throne of God and of Jesus. A fresh, flowing stream of water. And in John 14, Jesus said, Whoever believes in me will never thirst. And so, there's no longing, there's no thirst once we get there because that longing has been fulfilled. Well, let me ask uh, you in closing this morning, uh, do you have this longing for God? Do you long not just for God's blessings, the things that he can give you? Do you long for God himself? Do you long to be with God? Our real deep needs can only be met in him. And so family, take comfort in the fact that Herm is home. He's with God, and he's with loved ones who have gone on before him. He's with brothers and sisters who've gone before him. He's with his parents, and he's with some of the saints of Riesland Church who have gone before him as well. And I would encourage all of us to learn the lessons that God would want to impress upon us today uh, through his servant, Herm Hovey. Uh, the importance of faith the importance of church, the importance of service, the importance of longing for God.